Hey, Steve. <laughs> We're here, man. This is it, in We're, person. This is live. No man. scream, just, just us. No, but you know what? We've been doing this, uh, these kind of talks for years um, with wine involved uh, and now doing this in, in, in front of all these beautiful folks and really getting an insight to uh, our ideas around marketing and culture and inclusivity. Um, I'm happy to be here to have this conversation with you. Thanks for making it, and this is what we'll talk today about. But before we kick it off, one, let me just thank the Mexico. You have to close your eyes and imagine we're sitting on stage, Cologne, Germany, in front of 10,000 people, a lot I'm of there. noise, I'm there right energy. Now. Ah, yeah, we're, we're I'm there. Right there. And, I'm right uh, there. I'm right there. I'm just the part. I feel the We're dressed. Yep. I, I feel good. I feel like I'm right there right now. So, so thank you for having us. Um, my name is Adam Singold. I'm the founder and CEO uh, of Tabula. We... We just went public. We acquired a company called Connexity, um, which is big in Germany. We're in New York City and our headquarters. And with me is my very good friend, the one and only Steve Stout. If you want to say a few words about. I don't really want to. There's probably a Chiron under me right now. There's, uh, Fair enough. There's Steve Stout, founder of United Masters. And um, you know, we, we have built a, a creative uh, business uh, called Translation. We have built United Masses, which is our music distribution uh, company. They all are, they work together as one company. And I'm really excited about where the industry is going and, and talking about some of those things today. So, so, you know, Steve, you know, my dad is a musician. He plays the guitar, but, um, you know, it took him 20 years to build his reference, his, his community, people who got to know his music. And what I love about what you do and your you know, energy and passion and focus is so much about those you know, underdogs, the artists that are at the beginning of time who may not have the ability to sign a big label. Yeah. My dad, 20 years ago, and then you, know, you, you give them a chance to give them the platform. So I'm curious, how did you get to choose that segment and, and what do you give those people? It, so two things. My, my former life, I ran record companies. I was part of the legacy system that you're talking about. And unlike other industries, um, when music went digital, um, there was no way for artists to understand exactly who were streaming their music, who was the digital consumer. Um, if you're Amazon or you're any other digital company that does commerce, uh, part of the advantage of digital economy is that you actually know who, what the products are, so you can remarket to them right. in a very frictionless way. Um, if an artist sells X amount of albums in March and then puts out a new album in November, they have no idea who bought it in March. And that was the first thing I wanted to solve was sort of bringing CRM tools to the artists so that they wouldn't be beholden to needing to find this new consumer every single time. They would know who their fans are. And like every other digital economy uh, um, opportunity, they would be able to do the best they can with the fan base that they have. So it's interesting, you know, you speak about, you know, building those fans and getting to know your audience. Uh, and I'm thinking about this, this problem of distribution. I mean, so much has changed over the last 20 years. You know, 20 years yeah. ago, if you were a musician or, or, or someone who wrote a piece of content, you had no way of being in front of 10 or 20 or 30 or million people. Or a retailer. By the way, it's no different than a retail. The fan is a customer. No different than a customer of a retail. If, before, prior to e-commerce, it was very difficult. Unless somebody came to the one checkout, signed their name, right. and sent you a, a home address so you could send them a, a circular or some piece of content every month so that you, know, you could build a, a, a base, a, a, a communication with that, re, with that consumer. And, and artists, it was fan clubs, right? And, and those days have changed and shifted as things have gone digital. But music has been one of the things, and I can get into why, that's never had that connectivity. And it was actually done on purpose. So why is that? Why is music so different? Because in that case, the, the record companies, their moat, how they protected their business, was they realized that if the artists knew who their fans were directly, the artists would no longer need record companies. <laughs> right. So the record companies decided that in all of the deals that they were going to do with the Apples and the... Spotify's, they were never going to get the intelligence back that gave them the device IDs or the specificity of the audience 
that was being streamed because they would have to share that information with the artist. Um, and if they shared that, that information with the artist, it would be the demise of their, their business. I mean, that's one of the reasons why um, the legacy music companies are going through stress fractures right now, which is a great opportunity for independence and have music has become a big contributor to the creator economy. I came to your house and you told me that story and you said something that kind of stuck with me. And you said, you know, over the last 20 years, um, you know, music never had this connection you're talking about, but also the world changed around us in a way that now you have TikTok and Instagram and, and Snapchat and Facebook. So now you ask me, you know, what should an artist do? Should they create the next New York State of Mind or should they light their hair on fire, get exposure and then kind of distribute their, their, their content? And I'm curious, you know, what should artists do? What should someone who starts a blog, a publisher or an artist, how should they interact with this world of platforms? TikTok and, and Instagram are the new MTV. And Apple and Spotify are the new radio and record store. All right, so that's number one. But because we're in the attention economy, there's so much volume of content wherever you go. What's happening is slowly, there was always this relationship between uh, fame and talent. If you're really talented, what came with that is, a, is fame. Right. Over time, fame and talent has become at odds. You can be famous and not talented. So, in order to get attention, fame, a lot of people are doing a lot of things that is so opposite from actually proving out a talent and they're getting incentivized by it that you're starting to see not only artists but creators and um, actors, whoever, artists in general, not just music artists, do things for fame that are absolutely disconnected from their actual talent in order to create an audience to then eventually get that attention so that their talent can be recognized. It's, it's a shame that attention and fame has overtaken the value of talent in today's market. So you, you, you mentioned attention economy, and I think you know to get attention, because we only have 24 hours a day, that will never change. It's even harder if you're an emerging business, an emerging brand, someone who's just getting started. You don't have the, the budgets to advertise on Google, Facebook, and other distribution uh, platforms. You have to kind of reinvent ways to be discovered. Mm -hmm. And there's a great story that I met this guy from the UK who had a dream to start a headphone company. He wanted to sell headphones, but he had to fight Beats and Sony and Panasonic, and he had no chance doing so by, because he had no budgets, he had no brand. But he had this passion and story about a better quality product in his mind. Mm -hmm. So the way he went about doing that was creating a story about why he thinks people should connect with his product. And he used storytelling to be discovered. We put his story on the Daily Mail and Mirror and the Independent in the UK, and people gave him a chance, and now I met him a few years after, and he has a factory and he sells headphones. It's great. And it's completely counterintuitive to how perhaps a bigger brand would go about it. Look, I, I, look, I, I think original ideas matter. And um, you, know, you have to have an original idea. When you, you talk about Beats, you know, when Dr. Dre and Jimmy Iovine built Beats, there was many headphones in the market, whether it be Bose or JBL or you, know, you name the list, Sony headphones in the marketplace. They decided they were going to make a headphone um, that was culturally important. Um, you know, where, where the way you'd wear a new era Yankee baseball hat with that pride of wearing that hat and how cool it made you look, that the Beat headphones did that same thing. It was like an article of clothing, um, the way they treated it. They treated it like fashion. And that was a differentiator. It wasn't, it was loud. It was uh, irrational on its approach and, 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 and connection to culture. And that's what separated it from the pack. And I think that those are the types of ideas that you need to do to separate yourself. Um, be original and being honest who you are, but then find that lane that's not being occupied by your competitor and then go hard down that lane. This idea that we have to be everything to everybody is over. I think 
we're in a place now where you can actually get, you can go narrow and deep. You pick the lane, you pick the, 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 the brand values that really matter most, and then go find, not people who like you, find all the way down to the people who love you, right? So go narrow and deep. Um, and I think that's where you will find growth. You'll go deeper, you'll find growth, and you'll also not get caught up in a sea of sameness of everybody just looking like everything else. I think that happens in art, in business, with artists. I think that's the way to, and that's my approach. Um, and uh, I, I think that we've been successful approaching the market that way. So would you give a big brand, or how would you help a big brand think about this problem? Because you mentioned, I mean, I subscribe to everything you say, which is actually we change as consumers. We have to not only like the product, we have to love the brand. Yeah. We, we need, we're happy to pay, by the way. We're happy to pay commerce. We have so many more boxes outside of our house now. Mm -hmm. We buy more online. We subscribe to things. We sus subscribe to newspapers and retail and, and music. Uh, but we have to love. And how do you, you know, it's almost like we, you have to build an experience that people want to invite into their lives more than just selling them a product. But in the world of advertising, which we both know well, still most of the advertising in the open web are driven by banners. Steve, when is the last time you clicked on a banner? I, I've, I've got it now that business a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm not in that business anymore. <laughs> As a consumer. No, no, that's what I'm talking about. I You're, get out of that business Yeah, too. that's yes, right. <laughs> Most of us, but that's still most of the industry. So how but, should a brand do it? Listen, I gotta tell you something. I, you know, we, Translation, our advertising, our creative arm, you know, we represent some of uh, the world's greatest brand. The NBA is one of our clients. Um, AT&T, uh, the NFL, Beats, uh, Beats by Dre with Apple. Let we, and we work with these clients and we firmly believe that the connectivity between people um, is culture. So a lot of times, specifically in America, they, they look at census data and they go 18 to 24 black, 18 to 24 white, blah, 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 blah. And they believe that you can make marketing that fits these boxes. And I said a very long time ago, in fact, I wrote a book called The Tanning of America that's 10 years old um, today. Congrats. And I actually wrote in the book that there's a black kid in Compton, California, who's 17 years old, that has so much in common with a white kid in Greenwich, Connecticut, who's 17 years old, but the world of marketing doesn't understand the connection. They actually spend too much time focused on their differences. Trading side. We talked about that, but just before the pandemic, I'm not sure if you remember, in a WPP stream, we sat together for coffee and you, you know, we talked about how come the industry promotes targeting so much, to, you know, segments of demographics and create silos and boxes. And at the same time, the industry is trying to promote diversity. So how are those two things? Because, they, the, because the industry is incentivized by those boxes. It's the, 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 there's still a long tail of business that buys into the format of boxes versus understanding uh, the connective tissue of culture in why people see eye to eye. That's, 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 that's a business problem. That's the industry of media buying. That's not a real problem. That's an industry problem because they get paid too much money to have no ideas on how to think forward. Connecting people through culture, connecting people through shared values is obviously the way to move forward. You know, whether it be you, you, I like LeBron James, you like LeBron James, she likes LeBron James, whoever it may be, right? It has nothing to do with um, our race, creed, or, 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 or any of that thing, right? It's, it's really built around the fact that we have passion for basketball and that's the athlete in basketball that we, we react to. But the industry, the media buying industry, would much rather put it in segments and not understand, thoroughly understand that connectivity. And you see it in music and film and art and sport, but it's in everything. It's in products. It, it, it just, it, it's inherent uh, as consumers that we react and we feel something. Um, none of these things are built because they're built specifically for African-Americans or white people or, or anything like that. They're built for people who have a passion for that subject or for that product to engage with. And I believe that the marketers are doing a poor job, for the most part, the media buying companies, 
in really shifting their consumers, their, their, the brands that they represent, to buying much more on this connective basis than these legacy boxes that's been around for decades. Amen. Um, my last question uh, as we come to a wrap, um, for advertisers listening to our session, Mm -hmm. Some around the world uh, who you know who wish to be in New Mexico with us now. Yeah. Um, what what insights? What lessons? What could, what advice would you give an advertiser who wants to succeed that they can learn from the music industry? Oh, listen. The one thing about the music industry, whether it's the writers, um, the producers, the artists themselves, is the music industry is driven by understanding what's coming next. Um, Artists write what's going to happen. That's the business that they're in. I feel that if a brand is thinking about future-proofing themselves, they really need to listen and read the tea leaves of the music industry because they're always the one out in front. Um, that's just the nature of that industry. It has to be on to the next and on to the next. Fashion has to be on to the next, on to the next. The fact that music is on, has gone digital and that you can work with these artists and work with United Masses, specifically our company, and not only uh, connecting with the artists, but the fans of those artists, so that you can think about how do I target, work with, engage the next generation, Gen Z, understanding cultural currency, that's what the music business trades on. And um, uh, I just think it's very important for brands, if you're thinking about tomorrow, you're thinking about youth, and you want to understand culture, the music business can do a lot in helping unlocking that value for you. New Mexico, I want to thank you again, because I always wanted to be on stage with Steve, so this is the first time we're doing it. We've been friends for many years, but I always wanted someone to help put us together on stage. We've done it, thank you. Thank you, Steve, for, thank you for agreeing to uh, do this. Um, I love the topics we talked about, content, creation, culture, passion, music, love, all those things that really drive the reason we do what we do. And I hope we get to do this again on a real stage uh, in Germany soon. All right, brother, thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much for having me.